or uh, normative ideas. And then, of course, the question also becomes who mobilizes this? We'll come back to that. However, on the other hand, there are also um, notions that are very close to the institutionalization of, uh, of these ideas in law. So uh, their legal systems are built around them, uh, you, you could say. However, and you can say, well, of course, that's necessary. We, we need institutions that, uh, that build, build on the rule of law and human rights. But sometimes it also means that uh, they become um, a little bit of the background, the scenery, uh, rather than uh, the core business. And then uh, and, uh, you can see that people um, start uh, to standardize and bureaucratize them, which is not always uh, to the good. So there's this tension between mobilizing and f uh, focusing on them and uh, this, uh, this more managerial way of incorporating uh, these concerns. So we thought that was something to address. A second thing uh, that, we, uh, that we like to look at, also uh, in Infra uh, as a broader project, is how we can um, have a uh, contextual view of uh, rule of law and human rights, looking at both the positive and the negative side effects of pursuing them. So if you mobilize them and institutionalize them, what actually happens, and not only what happens to them, but what, what side effects does it have for other things? And how are there also crossovers between them? Uh, focusing on the rule of law, what does that do to human rights, and vice versa. So that's the second uh, important um, um, idea behind this, is that sometimes it may be counterproductive to, uh, to work on uh, human rights problems, for instance, but sometimes it may also uh, work in good ways that you hadn't anticipated. So that's, uh, that's the second uh, thing that we want to put on the table. And then thirdly, I, th uh, I think it's important to think about uh, the different actors that are involved in uh, mobilizing and institutionalizing human rights. Um, as a lawyer, uh, I have a tendency to look for court cases and the role of courts. But, of course, there are um, all kinds of governmental uh, organizations. And we have people uh, here from uh, the ministry, for instance, who are very much focused on working with human rights, but also intergovernmental organizations. Transnational corporations, which will be the focus, of course, of tomorrow, uh, they, are, they have a role in this, to play in this. Um, all kinds of regulators, governmental and non-governmental, business associations, NGOs, civic actors more generally. So there's there's a whole if you there's a, an enormous range basically of actors that that are that are part of this. And we think it's important to um, to acknowledge this and also to think of how they they can interrelate and stimulate each other in um, working with human rights. I mean, I'm based at the ISS, obviously, which is an interdisciplinary institute. Uh, we're economists, we're anthropologists, we're sociologists, and there's a couple of lawyers. And the first thing I learned in, uh, well, the first few weeks and months uh, that I was here at ISS is that there's a very strange relationship between law or even the field of law and development studies and development studies more, yeah, and, de and development studies more broadly. And uh, it was a, an enriching experience, ultimately. Uh, it's, it's led to me working together with uh, colleagues like Helen Hinchins, who's going to be here on the program, uh, with Will Hout uh, on areas of teaching, respectfully, and research. Um, and we've now also sort of found each other working together on this paper, which you're going to be hearing about uh, later in this program. Um, so what, where Sana and I also have met each other often is at conferences of the Law and Society Association. Also, Jonathan and Jackie are frequently at these meetings, and Kristen, yes, also. Well, maybe less, slightly less so, but this is another meeting place. These conferences are usually held close to, well, somewhere in North America. Occasionally, they're held closer to home, as in Berlin, but generally speaking, they're held in that particular part of the world. Um, but there's also something called the Dutch-Flemish Socio-Legal Studies Association, where we've also been quite active and have been sharing these ideas. Uh, and, you know, that's why it is that we take as our sort of methodology this sort of epistemological bridge between law and the social sciences, which is socio-legal studies, studying law in context, studying the social working of law, the economics of law, the politics of law. Uh, and therefore, the very long title, which lawyers and NGOs, I think, both uh, are often uh, guilty of, uh, is to look at both the normativity of law, the, the, its content uh, problems in that regard, but also the way in which it functions. So the rule of law and the role of law. Um, 
so these functional dimensions, of course, are going to be explored quite a bit in the panels to come. So the two thematic strands, the two themes that we focused on for this particular conference were, first of all, to focus on uh, the participation of persons who are affected by human rights practices, um, which also involves uh, looking at the role of government officials, uh, civic actors of many descriptions, business women and men, uh, as well as migrants, uh, uh, people from the Roma, Sinti, and travelers community. Um, and, well, as a social scientist, it's very important to recognize that you have to be very skeptical, very critical about speaking on people's behalf. Your positionality as a researcher has to be, uh, has, you have to be aware of that. And so that's something also which we, with an INFAR, are looking at uh, critically. Um, and then f the second main uh, theme uh, in which uh, these issues are addressed, uh, which is more uh, the discussion taking place tomorrow, is how efforts to integrate human rights concerns uh, form parts of broader policies of change uh, to pursue broader political, social, and economic goals, um, where human rights is a quite important dimension, um, according to some, and according to others, uh, as a core set of values. And so these, again, tension, well, it's a tension, but it's a very interesting uh, relationship. Some don't believe it's possible to look at normativity and functionality together. Uh, and we've been evolving those skeptics in this discussion, in particular, young clobbers. Uh, and we've been evolving uh, colleagues uh, who have a much, a somewhat more open approach to this, uh, such as Kim Lane Shepley um, from Princeton University, who we're pleased to say is also now president of our Law and Society uh, association. So we intend more for more of these conversations to come. So. Um, and I think it's now time to sort of to introduce um, the four panels uh, of the conference. And actually, I would, would like to invite Kinnery and Nathaniel to um, join us on, on the, this side because we de decided that you know having four panels and four co-organizers that we could do this together. Um, I'll stand up as well. That's. Um, um, and uh, we, we thought it would be good to have um, some um, well, visual material sort of to support our memories of what, what this is all about. Uh, unfortunately, this is uh, subtitled in, um, uh, in Dutch, but I will uh, translate uh, along uh, the way. This, uh, the title means, Our Condolences and Now Go Away. And uh, what you see here is... A uh, someone who is a traveler, but we don't hear it. And, but we don't hear it. And he's reading out a letter. Sound. There's no. Is there anyone there? Oh yeah. yeah. Um, um, well, this 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 video is about a traveler whose uh, mother passed away, and he got a letter from uh, the munis municipality c uh, with condolences, but also saying that he straightway had to. Um, vacate the caravan that was uh, that belonged to his mother because there was a policy yes nine weeks after my mother passed away everything should be gone here and I've refused we now have a court case we've won it but but the municipality doesn't accept it and doesn't let me live here uh, so the, the case will uh, actually uh, go in September and it's taken three years. So why does he want to stay in his caravan? Born and raised here? This is where I feel at home. It's very important to me. Um, so uh, what happens is that actually I think Leonie will be speak you will be speaking about the case or Claire will be uh, th it will be part of our first panel and I think this so this is about the so-called um, what, what used to be called the extinction policy of uh, caravans they've uh, we no longer refer it uh, uh, to it like that but that was uh, was the terminology and it was the idea that um, car places where there are caravans of, uh, of travelers are places uh, in the eyes of policymakers that are problematic, that you know, attract crime, that there, uh, and there should be less of them. Um, and, uh, but there was, at the, at the time when, uh, when these policies were instituted, actually not much realization that there are huge 
human rights issues involved in this. And that um, the, certain, the lifestyle and culture of uh, uh, Roma sentient travelers uh, is something that needs uh, protection also in the Dutch context. And it's not just about equality, but also about recognizing uh, difference. So I think that is a theme that sort of um, sums up uh, our, uh, some core issues in our first panel, which is going to be about citizenship and discrimination. And I pass the mic uh, to you, oh, no, to you, you have one. I'll pass the one, uh, my mic to Kinnery, who will be next. Okay, so the second panel is about contested constitutionalism. And we're speaking in three different uh, contexts, but they actually have some interesting similarities. So there's some, of course, historical linkages. There are some legal similarities. And um, the illustration which we have here is actually, uh, well, as you can see, a uh, protest action against the current president. Uh, this is a protest which took place last year in April. And um, what's interesting about it is that the theme song uh, of the National Democratic Party, the political party of President Bautrisse, has been uh, an iconic song, uh, which uh, I will be surprised if uh, any of you in this room don't know what it is. So let's just play this. Okay, so you saw the lady there very proudly proclaiming her solidarity with what was happening there. Again, the song was reappropriated. Uh, it was a song that's beloved by many people, including myself, I have to say. And uh, as you'll hear a bit later, I worked uh, as, a, as an advisor to the International Commission of Jurists, as a trial observer in the trial against President Bautrisse. You'll hear about this a bit more later on in the program. And when this song came on the airwaves, uh, it sent shivers down the spines of journalists working in the country. And I was very curious about it because I thought, well, this song to me is a song of togetherness. It's a song of oneness, setting aside differences, national unity. Uh, despite the various economic and constitutional crises facing the country, the intention of Bautrisse was to try to bring the people together. And it was for a particular kind of reason. And uh, this particular group of protesters, uh, which are part of the political opposition to Bautrus, that reappropriated the song and brought it in as part of the protests. Critics argue that it is indeed intended to convince Surinamers that what happened in the past, this is again Bautrus' use of the song, uh, including civil war and the atrocities in 1982, should be resigned to history. And again, the political opposition, fed up by Bautrus, with Bautrus in his presidency, have reappropriated the song as in this march in uh, April last year. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, so to illustrate panel three, which is on human rights and CSR, um, I've chosen this map of the One, One Road Project, or OBOR, which is a Chinese-driven network of infrastructure projects um, that's going to connect 65 countries for trade connectivity between Asia, Europe, and Africa. And it, the idea is that it will follow the land and the maritime route of the ancient Silk Road. So it's a transnational initiative of development projects, building all kinds of assets, road, rail, air, pipelines, involving lots of goods, services, and obviously global supply chains. And about nine major projects have already been financed. So I think this map is quite striking for its depiction of the transnational spread of the project and also the societal relevance of the project. Um, and also you see the kind of land routes running from China to southern Europe via the Netherlands, via the port of Rotterdam, 
and the sea route will be connecting Shanghai uh, to Europe via India and via Africa. So this project is a, it's a massive project, it's partly financed by um, the creation of special, special purpose vehicles, two large supported development banks as well. Um, tons of private companies are going to be providing money, uh, equipment, financing, loans, equities, guarantees. Um, and a lot of the themes that our panellists are going to talk about I think really res resonate well in this project in terms of access to justice, how communities are going to... Um, what, well, first of all, what will be the human rights impacts of these kinds of projects? Um, that's not of, none of it has been uh, tracked yet, the kind of confidential information of the project uh, documents, project agreements hasn't been apparent. Um, under what kind of environmental and social conditionalities will the new development banks in China um, actually loan money? China, again, has not published a comprehensive list of all the deals. Um, human rights footprints, um, what are the kind of obligations? Uh, how are they going to, what dilemmas and tensions are they going to pose with the financing operations? And what steps can, we, by, can states make to internalize their own um, international uh, human rights obligations? And how seriously will Chinese companies embed the UN guiding principles on human rights? You know, will they produce a roadmap on any of these issues? The World Bank and other international organizations will be involved in this project. So you know, when they're around a table with Chinese companies, you know, will, will they, in the negotiations, will their use of environmental and social conditions be negotiated out? because they won't be providing the lion's share of the financing. So a lot of conversations about power asymmetries, which really cuts through a lot of the CSR discussions on human rights. Um, and without Chinese commission, uh, commitments to transparency on full disclosure of all the documents, how will NGOs keep crucial checks and balances on accountability of uh, human rights obligations? Yeah, and in, in panel four, you know, we'll play a short video now for about a minute. In panel four, we take a specific interest in the mining industry. This is like a spin-off of the corporate social responsibility topic, but we'll take a... This is a very important uh, area where we see human rights, human rights issues and problems. C could you please... Oh, just uh, collapsed, sorry. Oh. Uh, <clears throat> even after checking everything, things are bound to break down at some stage. <laughs> India's most remote tribes. A mountain they revere as a god, and a multinational mining company with its sights set on the mountain's sacred stone. The stage is set for a bitter struggle against the backdrop of eastern India's dramatic landscapes. As the bulldozers draw closer, what will one tribe do to save their forest, their mountains, and their god? I think that's it. There's a long video, interesting video, if you might want to see. I think we can all think of a few more mining-related human rights controversies. I mean, on the way here coming, I was checking my, my email and seeing this news story about my own country, Ethiopia, where a gold mining company came under severe protest, and the government had to cancel its second renewal of a mining licenses. And the same as the, what happened here in this case, the Indian Supreme Court had to cancel the mining permits from Vedanta, uh, uh, which is a mining, a huge mining company in India. Uh, there, I think I want to say two things that we're, we're interested in, hopefully we'll see from our panelists, but also from our discussants. First is how, how do we see human rights actually play a role in protecting uh, so social, uh, environmental, individual human rights concerns in mining activities? I mean, what norms are utilized 
in what ways. So the details, we've got, I think, some fantastic, even anthropological uh, research that we, uh, we're going to hear from. So I'm interested in those type of questions, but how do you really utilize human rights concept in resisting um, such type of mining activities? But also I'm interested in, this is the second point, in, in the critical type of questions, but what is also going on when we, when we utilize human rights in resisting, for example, bad societal consequences in mining activities. For example, who does the, who does the, who, the mobilization? In this particular case, Survival International, a UK-based NGO, was very instrumental in print, uh, bringing the matter to the forefront of public attention, but also pushing through uh, legislative and judicial channels. So are we having another rerun of you know, Macau Mutua's uh, you know, saviors, savages, and victims scenario where we have strong external actors saving locals from uh, savage locals uh, or multinational co corporations? Um, and, and this idea, and this is my last point, I think somebody said to the effect of, I don't remember the exact quote, somebody said to the effect of, people in the business of radical change tend to forget that radical ideas, ideas soon become routines and institutionalized, and they themselves become orthodox that need to be challenged again. So this type of reflexive questions, I, I wish to be addressed, I hope they would be addressed, both by the speakers and also by the, panel, uh, by the discussants on the panel on extractive industries. Okay, um, I think that we uh, only need to introduce our two final items on the program. Do we have a slide for the final one, actually? Uh, this, is, uh, this is the next one, right here. Yeah, yeah we have one for the very final. Yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. No, uh, because uh, tomorrow, after our uh, sort of su substance panels, we're going to uh, take it at a slightly more abstract level and look at cross-cutting issues that. I think will come up in all four panels, and we've uh, termed, uh, we want to do this in, in the form of a roundtable. Um, we've uh, given it the title, The Legal as Political, Mobilizing Human Rights, while well, we've already explained why uh, that, um, um, that is our focus. And we really want to focus on what is the political value of using human rights. So not just you know, as, as a standard legal way of uh, of uh, going about things, but what's its politi political meaning sp specifically? And then our second question there is th the actor focus, right? Uh, who is mob being mobilized and for what purposes? Um, and that actually, I think that taps into the last remarks that Nathaniel ma uh, made, that you really need to think about um, critically about who you're involving and uh, what that does to someone and what it does to yourself as well. Okay. Over to you. So um, this has indeed been something which we've been exploring within, within INFAR uh, in various places, and it's indeed an extension of our coffee conversations. The very last uh, slide, which uh, concerns our rounding up, is going to be from our colleague uh, from South Africa, Jonathan Claren. Um, he is going to speak to a topic which really cuts across all these different themes and indeed case studies. Uh, with uh, a keynote on new African perspectives on corporate criminal accountability. This will speak to, of course, questions of legal mobilization. It will also speak to dilemmas in uh, realizing business uh, uh, human rights within the action, the activities of, of corporate business. It will also address, I presume, because I know it's a theme you've been looking at a lot, state capture. Okay. Oh. <laughs> It's not an invitation, but more or less an assumption that I, uh, that I make. Um, but again, uh, conversations that we've been having in different parts of the world, we're very happy that you joined us to this discussion here in The Hague uh, at our uh, Infra conference. And, well, we open up the conference. Thank you very much. Yeah. So now we're going to move around and uh, actually what I want to do is invite uh, the panelists of the first panel to join me on, uh, at the big table. Uh, I was counting chairs and they're still not enough because this is, I think, the biggest panel we have because we have co-presenters as well. Uh, pick a chair, anyone that you feel comfortable with. Um, actually, I think I'll sit here. Um, and on this first panel, which I already in we already introduced, which is on citizenship and discrimination. Um, we have uh, four papers, and I think we need another chair. Yeah. 
You want to be together? Yeah, okay. Move me this way. Yeah, well, that's fine. Okay. Um, so we have, uh, we have four papers, and we have actually uh, two co-presented uh, ones. But you're, you're here, Helen, you're here on your own, right? Yes, yeah. So uh, co-authored, but not co-presented. And um, it's um, actually the folk, although the title of this panel is Citizenship and um, Discrimination, this is not, um, it has a m more focused content because we're, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the panel will actually specifically address the case of uh, Roma, Sinti and travelers that not the case that I've uh, uh, talked about, although I think Leonie and Claire will talk about that, but Roma, Sinti and travelers are sort of our, our, our focal points to, in order to address these broader issues, um, I would say. So what I would like to do is uh, to give the floor first to uh, Yulia Sarelic. Uh, is that roughly? Oh, thank you. And she, is, um, uh, she works at the uh, Catholic University of Leuven. Um, and the title of her presentation is Invisible Edges of Citizenship, Readdressing the Position of Roma from a Global Perspective. And now, Julian, the question is, do you want to sit or stand? Because we have a... Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Could you please come over to... Uh, to yes, if you stand, then you, uh, you take the podium, right? Oh, oh, that's fine. And then you have the, the microphone there. Okay, uh, so Julia, the floor is yours uh, for your talk. I think your uh, presentation is there. You have the clicker. Yes, I do. And um, you're good to go. Well, thank you very much. I hope I'm not breaking the panel too much because I'm standing. But I have this, I used to live in Italy, and I have this, uh, uh, this uh, um, habit of talking with my hands. So I think it's a little bit easier to talk with the hands if uh, you, <laughs> you, you do stand. So hello, everyone. My name is Julia Serdelic. I do indeed come from the Catholic University of Leuven. I work for the LINES. This is the Leuven Institute for International and European Studies. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I'm a Marie Curie uh, postdoctoral fellow there, working on my project, which is indeed entitled, similarly to uh, my presentation today, Invisible Edges of Citizenship, uh, Readdressing the Position of Roma uh, in Romani Minorities in Europe. Uh, just to say something, because I think I'm a little bit uh, an outsider. Let me... Ah, down, okay, thank you. So I, I sometimes call myself an academic nomad because I held many different uh, positions over the years. So I, I have a PhD in sociology, but I was also a research fellow at the School of Law at the University of Edinburgh and a Max Weber fellow at European University Institute in Florence. And I still hold the position of a, pol of a postdoctoral researcher at the School of Law and Social Justice at the University of Liverpool. I do as it has been already discussed here. I, am a, I have a PhD in sociology, but I do socio-legal research on broader research uh, uh, topics uh, such as citizenship and migration, but particularly focus on the, uh, on the, the marginalized minorities and, uh, and the forced migrants. Uh, and the other strand of research, as you see here, is also the politics of diversity on the, after the 2015-16 refugee crisis. Uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, in today's presentation is actually uh, a synopsis of uh, uh, my book uh, manuscript, which I'm working on at the moment, uh, because this is a work in progress. All the, all the suggestions and comments on how to improve this are really more than welcome and really, really highly appreciated. So when we discuss Roma, for example, also like uh, we take like very, very, uh, for example, certain like documents from Council of Europe, we see that... Uh, uh, Roma referred to as to uh, Europeans, European minority par excellence. Uh, in multicultural citizenship, uh, uh, they're discussed as a hard case because they, not, they do not really fit um, basically the description definition of a national minorities or uh, indigenous people uh, and not immigrants either. And in public policy, it's, they're many times discussed as an isolated case. Uh, but my claim is that 
we need to turn the focus of the debate. Uh, as uh, Jeff pointed in the beginning, uh, the positionality of researchers is very, very important. So I'm not here to speak on behalf of Roma. However, what I'm looking at is how the position of Roma is formed as such in the society. And I do claim that we need to like, somehow turn the perspective and look at something what I call invisible edges of citizenship, which I claim exist globally. And uh, these are like certain mechanisms that uh, put also other marginalized minorities uh, in a similar position as Roma. What I do in my research is a socio-legal analysis of citizenship and minority acts and also court cases and so on which I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, down or? Yeah, I'm pressing down, it doesn't. Ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so very briefly, I, I don't think that I have to discuss a lot about uh, who the Roma are, because um, I think that most of the people here in the room know that Roma minorities are minorities. I use Romani minorities because I include uh, not just those who identify themselves as Roma, but also, for example, Gitanos, Manush, Travelers, Sinti, and so on. Um, and like according to the European uh, Commission statistics, there are around f uh, 12 to 50 million Roma, uh, million Roma in Europe. And they're practically in every European state, excluding Malta. And uh, they are defined as a marginalized minorities. For example, Fundamental Rights Agency said that 80% uh, of Roma live below the poverty line in Europe. Of course, we do not uh, need to repeat that they're also a stigmatized minority uh, who are facing uh, also, especially in the last years, uh, anti-Gypsism. What is very interesting and what is really Basically, there is a stereotype in the media that Roma, uh, especially from Central and Eastern Europe, are nomadic. However, if we really look at we would see that most Roma communities are immobile. Most of them, not all, but most of them. But they are non territorial and they are transborder minority. Some even are argue that they're a stateless nation, which is, can be problematic because, for example, then uh, certain right wing groups use that to say that, uh, okay, they're without uh, their own state so they do not belong to any state. Um, and like, as I already said, they're considered as hard case for multicultural citizenship. Uh, but the question that I also want to ask is what are the parallels with uh, other uh, basically marginalized minorities? Here is we see the, that Roma have also started uh, a civil rights movement, uh, changing their name from gypsies to Roma on 8th of April in 71. And this uh, civil rights movement is still going on. Uh, and also, for example, what is forgotten that they have been like victims of the Second World War. Uh, this is the memorial uh, in Berlin, which is very close to the, uh, to the uh, parliament, German parliament. Uh, and, but what I want to discuss is not just like some general comparison with other marginalized minorities. What I do want to see is also how actually they are positioned as citizens uh, uh, who are marginalized. So I have a special definition of uh, invisible edges of citizenship, which is, uh, so it's not direct anti-gypsism or romaphobia, but is the policies, legislation, and practices that contribute to the marginalization of Roma, yet do not specifically target them, but all citizens, either on national or EU level. These are broader and cannot be directly encompassed by uh, romaphobia or anti-gypsism. The edges of citizenship uh, demonstrate where the inclusion of all citizens, citizens uh, is limited. And at the same time, it creates a space where Roma became disproportionately represented. So this is my definition of uh, invisible as a citizenship, and I'll try to show them on some examples. Uh, one of the examples that is coming more and more into the public debates is that was actually also uh, discussed by the European Parliament uh, in the end of 2017 is Roma as non-citizens, Roma who are stateless. According to UNHCR, UNHCR data, there are around 75% of world stateless populations belong to mi minorities, but not any kind of minorities, those who are marginalized. Uh, this is especially for, uh, if we think about Roma, uh, from states that were disintegrated, from former Yugoslavia, former Czechoslovakia, but also who were forced migrants in Italy or have not even moved at all, for example, like places in Romania. But what is interesting when it comes to Roma, uh, they are de facto stateless, so not uh, recognized as the Euro stateless, uh, and do not fall under the definition of the two UN conventions on statelessness, but they're in fact in the legal limbo. So they do not have access in, to their citizenship, but at the same time, they do have the right to the citizenship, but no rights from this. 
Uh, at the moment, there is a court case at the European Court of Human Rights, uh, Hassani versus the former Yugoslav uh, Republic of Macedonia, where actually, although she was uh, de facto stateless, the court started uh, referring to her as a stateless person, which is really, really interesting uh, turn because uh, up until now, it was usually, they were not considered to be stateless, but just looking at different uh, uh, human rights violations. The other thing that is really discussed a lot is the EU freedom of movement, which is like one of the, according to the Directive 2004-38 EC, is one of the main rights of all EU citizens. Uh, as long as, as the directive says, they do not become an unreasonable burden. And there was a court case that I know that everybody in the room knows, uh, Elisabetta Dano and Florin Dano versus the Job Center Leipzig. And this court case is really, really interesting because um, it does not mention that it's about Roma anywhere. And it was basically about uh, uh, the news about these debates in welfare tourism and so on. However, what was interesting that the media uh, did pick up that uh, it was mostly like later on the debates were dealing with the position of Roma. And for example, two Euroactive articles that were discussing uh, welfare tourism, they did not mention Roma as well, but did uh, actually produce very stereotypical uh, images of Roma. For example, Roma panhandler in Sweden. I don't know if you can see that on this picture. The, the caption below is Roma panhandler in Sweden. Um, what is also interesting, it's, also, it's uh, a little bit less discussed, but in, uh, it came to light also during the uh, refugee crisis. This is the debate on so-called bogus asylum seekers, bogus asylum seekers in, uh, of course, uh, uh, inverted commas. Uh, here I showed that some data about how many asylum seekers applied for asylum in Germany uh, after there has been visa liberalization uh, happened in uh, most of the Western um, Western Balkan countries. And what was very interesting that most of these people, I don't know if you can see on the graph, oh, it's very bad, unfortunately, identified themselves as Roma. And the European Parliament uh, sent a message to Serbia and Macedonia that they will actually uh, uh, limit the visa-free uh, regime for uh, the Schengen countries, for these two countries, if uh, um, the number of asylum seekers keeps on growing. What happened in return was that, for example, Macedonia started doing uh, racialist border profiling and uh, basically started um, on the basis of skin color and where people lived, started not allowing people to cross border in Macedonia uh, if they were decided it was Roma and if they were potential asylum seekers. And they even put like, you can see the photo uh, stamp which says AZ, so that if they wanted to leave in the future, they wouldn't, wouldn't be able to. There was also a case at the Constitutional Court uh, in Macedonia, and of course it was uh, decided there was the racial discrimination. Uh, another thing that's very interesting uh, was when there was a number of asylum seekers from countries like Hungary seeking asylum in Canada. That, was, that happened after uh, there was a case of uh, Roma being killed by the right-wing groups uh, in Hungary, uh, which uh, then there was a court case where these people got um, actually the life sentence for this. But there was actually a proof for these people that they can, they had the basis to seek asylum, and many of them did get asylum. However, they found themselves again into this uh, polit politicized juggling if you s recognize some country as, uh, as a new country, as an unsafe country for uh, their citizens. So it's really, really interesting juggling where the Roma, uh, Roma found themselves in. Um, Another case that was really interesting was uh, the case in Bulgaria where a woman who was not Roma but lived in the Roma neighborhood uh, said that there was a discrimination with services uh, based on ethnic uh, origin because the electric company in Bulgaria put the poles for electricity uh, like five meters, so basically to, a lot higher than in other, uh, in other districts, saying uh, that the reason behind was that they said, okay, that the Roma are stealing electricity, and they wanted to prevent this. Uh, but basically the court decided that that was actually uh, not an equal uh, treatment. Um, another case was the uh, school segregation case, uh, Orsius and others versus Croatia. And this is the photo of one of the, um, one of the classes in Croatia. Uh, so it's a Roma-only class. I did, uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I collected these photos. 
And uh, it was really interesting that that was the crucial moment there was that Croatia was an EU country and Roma were just EU citizens to become. And uh, activists wanted to use this moment to say, okay, we will now uh, try to use this and use this court case that it comes to EU conditionality that uh, uh, segregated classes must be abolished. However, Croatia became a new member state when it wrote also into the national strategy on Roma inclusion that they will abolish Roma only classes by 2020. These classes still exist up, to, up until the present day. Uh, so, I mean, some of the parallels with other marginalized minorities are very, very obvious, some less so, but I think I will try to like raise them in, uh, in uh, the book, I'm, in the manuscript that I'm currently writing. For example, okay, I'm showing here uh, the desegregation process in the US, and here's an article about desegregation of Roma classes, where, for example, journalists said that uh, desegregation is uh, uh, not a problem, but what is a problem that is that we have she called this uh, Roma terror. So basically that Roma are the ones who are terrorizing the majority population. So there was a big, big uh, backlash against uh, uh, desegregation in, uh, of Roma classes, for example, in, like, in places like uh, Croatia. And also like uh, the teachers themselves said, okay, we do not know what to do. We have the white flight, basically uh, majority parents are leaving the schools and so on. But it's really interesting that there are very, very clear parallels here. Um, what is actually less clear, but I think it's very, very important, uh, when I was doing some research in Australia, I was able to see that actually the indigenous Australians are treated in a very, very similar way as Roma are in many countries. That is like actually as semi-citizens or se second-class citizens. And it's also interesting to see uh, how they're treated like this. And one of the questions, okay, that is constantly raised is, uh, connected to territory, and also here the question of mining actually comes in. Um, but how does this connect to uh, Roma? Roma are usually considered to be uh, nomadic, but at the same time, I think this will be discussed more, they're also considered as the ones that can be moved from the territory, relocated from the ter territory a lot easier than, uh, than for example, uh, somebody who is of a majority population. And here, the question of territory comes in, and the question of why Aroma usually is uh, considered as a non-territorial minority, and what consequences this has uh, also when we consider them like this, so as if they're not connected to the territory, which is really problematic. Uh, and if we see, for example, indigenous rights, there is a different story going that, okay, indigenous people are connected to the territory. However, at the same time, the governments, different governments do take this uh, uh, different justifications to get involved into their territory on different bases. That happened, uh, uh, for example, uh, in, uh, when it came to certain mining questions in Australia. Uh, Another question where I think that is really important, I mentioned in the beginning the UNHCR shows that um, most Isla people are uh, basically belonging to different marginalized minorities. Uh, it's interesting how they become, uh, in the first place, marginalized, discriminated, and how that feeds into statelessness. And here's another like global parallel when it comes to Roma. Uh, so Rohingya uh, refugees, were stateless, uh, became stateless after they were like marginalized and discriminated against. But then uh, citizenship laws that were introduced uh, showed that like they were like categorized as illegal uh, immigrants. For example, when we take uh, Roma in places like Montenegro, due to very complex reasons, uh, the ones who fled because of the war in Kosovo, they're also constantly being um, in this position that they will be defined as illegal immigrants. Um, I'll just talk very quickly about my preliminary conclusions that uh, I believe that the invisible agents of citizenship is a special conundrum for citizenship theory. So where citizenship should be inclusive for all, also minorities that have been in certain territory uh, for a longer time, it excludes marginalized minorities. And that's not just trauma, but that happens in many, many cases around the globe. It happens on the uh, status dimension, on rights dimension, but also belonging dimension. And the question should not be only simply if Roma fit or not. This is a question of uh, actually based on cultural racism, but uh, we need to see how these uh, uh, edges of citizenship are occurring and how can we prevent them so that uh, citizenship is uh, truly inclusive for all. For all. 
uh, what I believe in this case is that the citizenship itself needs to be reconceptualized so that it will be truly inclusive for all. Thank you very much. And all the comments, questions are more than welcome. Thank you.